by the military industrial complex. And now the Taliban will pay a price. Do we have the confidence to do in the Middle East what our fathers and grandfathers accomplished in Europe and Asia? The situation in Afghanistan is deteriorating. What I do oppose is a dumb war. Podcast. Right. <laughs> All right, everybody, welcome to the season finale for season two of the Boardwalk Podcast. Um, just a really quick notes about the show. I think we're going to look at coming back probably after the 4th of July weekend. Uh, we've got some ideas for maybe like a bonus episode here or there, but no promises. Uh, either way, episode 40, this has been a whole lot of fun and really excited for tonight's episode. We've got Jordan Laird on with us and... Uh, Jordan is somebody that we we found through a uh, a mutual follower on Instagram, and like, just reading up on Jordan's story, it's it's very uh, very powerful, and it ties into a, a topic that we had discussed last year after recording an episode with Matt Jarvis, and we wanted to talk about just mental health and the veteran community. And so uh, I'm going to shut up now, and I'm going to hand it over to Jordan to kind of introduce himself, and we're just going to go from there. So Jordan, the floor is yours, man. Thanks for coming on. Yeah. So as he, as he told you, my name is Jordan Laird. Um, and I was a Marine Corps scout sniper. I was in the Marine Corps for 12 years. I did basically six active four reserve, um, was with two, five, three, five, two, 23 and three twenty five. Um, did four back to back deployments at first on active duty was in Ramadi, uh, in Karma with two, five, did two Mews and finished it out with saying in 2010 with three five. Um, after that, I got out and started doing private contracting and I did that up until about 2016. And by 2017, I had found myself homeless, unemployed, divorced, and uh, it was definitely a culture shock. And so I've spent the last five years basically since 2017 uh, getting my mental health back in track, getting treatment for my brain injury, um, and just re-putting my life together that I so quickly destroyed. Um, and I, I wouldn't have if I would have had the help I, I, I should have known to look for in the first place. Okay, can you tell us a little bit about, um, I guess, um, you mentioned having a brain injury. Can you tell us a bit about how that came about and how, how it was all diagnosed and, and found out later? Yeah. So for me, it's kind of hard to pinpoint. It could have been a couple different things initially. Um, like when I was a boot, like when I first joined the Marine Corps, um, doing training, doing mount stuff, taking falls, hit and hit on the Kevlar, um, we were in a really small room when a main main cannon round went off uh, from a tank doing a live fire training course, put over pressure to the entire room and knocked us all pretty much unconscious. Um, and then after that, doing wall charges, laws, AT4s, um, and then going into the sniper platoon, you're working, you're just shooting sassers like the 50 cals all the time. Um, and just that cumulative concussive blast, when you don't get treated, brain injuries are cumulative. So each blast would just make it worse and worse. And um, I didn't really understand that. I thought, oh, I'm just getting tired or I'm just being lazy or whatever. Um, it was something that had to do with me. It was something I could fix until I went to Sangin in 2010 and then there's just IEDs all over the place. Um, we were in the vicinity of or getting blown up ourselves constantly. And even though there was a three strike rule, you know, whenever the corpsman would ask if we're doing okay or not, we'd say, yeah, we're fine. Nothing happened because three strikes meant we were out and then we weren't able to patrol with our brothers anymore. And I mean, that mentality was, was promoted at the time. Um, but it paid its consequences. Um, so far, what I've been reading and what I've been learning over the past couple of years is brain injuries take like a while to manifest. So depending on how long since that initial brain injury and then you keep going and going and going without treatment, usually there's a period of like incubation and then all of a sudden it's like your brain just starts going crazy. So for like me, 
specifically, I was contracting um, in about 2014. Uh, it just started getting really, really weird. I, I don't know how to explain it. I started getting like a speech impediment, couldn't do basic math, fog, tired, like tired beyond belief. Like uh, there was nothing I could do, no, no amount of rest I could get to, to feel energized. And then on top of that, I couldn't sleep at all. And then so I'd have nights where I wouldn't be able to sleep for like two or three days. And um, I thought it was just a mental health thing. So I was like, I'd go to the VA and be like, hey, I need medication for, uh, you know, I'm tired or I'm depressed. And so they put me on antidepressants or antipsychotics or they put me on different amphetamines and those would only mask the symptoms and then certain symptoms would get worse. And then by 2017, I had like gone off the complete deep end and absolutely ruined my life. And it was sitting there being homeless. I was like, what happened? Like what happened? And then somebody, a brother of mine was like, dude, you should probably go check uh, for, see if you had a brain injury. And so I went to the VA, I went and did a bunch of testing they're like, yeah, you're like half retarded. And I was like, all right. And so once I figured that out, it just turned into switching things like diet, making sure I'm getting enough fatty acids, making sure I'm taking vitamin E, K, like all these things that actually improve brain health instead of taking all these like opiates and drugs and all these other things that just mask those symptoms, if that makes sense. It's like <clears throat> when, when, you, when you talk about, you know, 2014 is where uh, you, you start to experience these symptoms. And then it's 2017, right, where you, where you finally hit, I, I guess, if, if you would put it, your rock bottom, right? Yeah, that, that three year, That three-year stretch, like, so you've, you, you, you had started to reach out and get help and they had, you know, diagnosed the TBI. Um, was there a, was there any significant improvement or because it, like, Trying, trying to look at it from the outside perspective, right? It's like, okay, you, you, know, you know you need help and now you're reaching out to get help, but it's just, from your story, it sounds like it wasn't getting better. Were there still things just being missed? Yeah, so like I said, it would, it would like fix some things, but then like, so for instance, they got me on amphetamine. So then I was able to stay up and I had energy because um, I was on Adderall, but then I would have these horrible crashes and then so I'd be really, really tired. So then you'd, I'd have to start taking more Adderall to stay awake more. Um, but then when I was out, I took myself off for Adderall. Uh, it was just like, I, I couldn't, I couldn't stay awake. I was just depressed and anxious. And then, so they put me on antidepressants. I was on like Zoloft and well, Butrin and Paxil. And I, I mean, I, I, I tried all of them and it was like, some of them would make me suicidal and some of them would, I wouldn't feel anything or they'd make me very lethargic to where, uh, like I just had no feelings. And so the reason I took myself off those almost immediately is because I started having suicidal thoughts and not because it's like, oh, I'm depressed, I'm suicidal. It was like, I, I, I don't know how to explain it. It was like the most emotionalist feeling of suicide. It was like, well, my day pretty much sucks today, so I might as well kill myself. Or uh, to make an extreme example, I get the wrong order at McDonald's or something, and I asked for a six-piece chicken nugget, and they gave me a four-piece or whatever. And then I'd be like, I might as well just kill myself. Like, it made me not care about anything. And so it was, like, super extreme. And, uh, yeah, no, the help I was getting was good in the sense of, like, I started going to counseling. and um, they kind of bring up certain issues, but nothing was hitting the root cause. And, and the root cause for me specifically was proper nutrition, proper rest, proper um, like regimented uh, scheduling and, and doing stuff to actually work with your brain. And yeah, because you have a brain injury, certain things are just not going to come back. Certain things are going to be a challenge. Um, like social cues for me are really hard to pick up on when I'm in a public setting or when I'm in a conversation. I tend to interrupt because I'll have like a, a thought on the tip of my tongue and I don't want to lose it. So I'll just kind of blurt it out. 
and, and like learning those kind of things and different uh, tips and tricks that like kind of reintegrate. Those were the biggest things that actually helped me uh, get to where I am today. But from 2014 to 2017, it was a it was a crapshoot. I was trying anything and everything. My marriage was um, just I was I was totally jacking that up to say the least um, because I didn't know what was going on. She didn't know what was going on, and uh, it was a mess. And so uh, once I finally started getting better, I ended up getting remarried um, to a, a, my new wife, and she was one of the main catalysts to know you're getting off all your drugs and you're going to do all this natural stuff and this is what's going to fix you because this is what's wrong and i was like all right and lo and behold man that's when i started reading on everything i could learn about nutrition diet fitness i uh, started going to school for psychology and um and all that stuff is where I learned all that. Now I'm on, hopefully going to be on this board that we just got approved for, for a brain health study uh, with the DOD and just doing a bunch of nonprofit work and serving to help people see that there's another alternative. Because I realized like through all the studies, you'll notice that a majority of people that are incarcerated that have committed crimes or do whatever, have brain injuries, divorces, brain injuries, really random active behavior, like spending lots of money for no reason or midlife crisis mode kind of stuff, brain injuries. And and it's like, that is the one of the biggest pandemics we have is is undiagnosed brain injuries. And and how Jordan, because uh, because you mentioned it, I mean, it, it, what, what a turnaround. I mean, anybody that's that read your story online, I mean, that's that that is quite the turnaround but if we can go back for a second if you don't mind talking about yeah, it um, absolutely it, you did um you did contracting we, we all did contracting as well um and yeah. I, I can only imagine what being uh an armed contractor pays probably more than we made as intelligence guys over there um it has to be and i, I was thinking like how did you how did you go from you know that a lucrative career like that to like you said being homeless like was it you mentioned like spending a lot of money and doing all that it was that was that something that happened when you stopped doing the contracting thing or um what was it quick or was it kind of like a slow kind of spiral out of that um it was actually almost night and day so i had picked up another job working for the doe doing contracting in the states um, after being home for two years. So from about 2014, mid 2014 to beginning of 2016, um, I was living in a trailer next to uh, my wife and kids who were in their house um, just because we were trying to save money from uh, the contracting in general. So we had about 80,000 uh, 80, stashed away. And then when I got the new job, job we bought a house and then through actions of my own, um, basically borderline, I don't know, I struggle with calling it alcoholism because it wasn't that I needed it. I was drinking to put myself to sleep, if that makes sense. It wasn't like, uh, like a daily addiction. I've worked with alcoholics doing, doing construction work and like, that, that they are impressive, but I was drinking a lot just to numb everything about me. Um, I ended up cheating on my wife and uh, we, I quit my job uh, and moved all the way across the country um, to try and save my marriage. And so I gave her all the money for the sale of the house. I gave her all the things and basically anything I could fit in my car was mine. And, um, and I ended up getting a felony DUI and I was mixing medications and alcohol and I should have thought about that. And, uh, it was, it was instant. I woke up the next morning in, in the cell jail cell there. And, uh, my marriage was over. My, my life as I knew it as a contractor was over because I got, I picked up a felony DUI 
and uh it was like i was being forced to slow down and actually get help if that makes sense yeah man thank thanks for sharing um i know a lot of people uh probably myself included uh it's it, it's you don't drink to have a good time like drinking is a uh, it is a is a mind slower down agent yeah is, is absolutely because like um, you don't somebody's an alcoholic doesn't buy a six pack of beer and then pound all six beers in like 10 minutes like that's clearly somebody who's trying to numb life and go to sleep and just end it you know yeah now i mean there's um yeah i i know i've certainly felt that way right like when we started doing this podcast uh like the initial thought was to do like a current events thing because everybody else is doing one. So why not a couple of Intel guys with critical thinking skills? And then yeah. we talked for an hour about Afghanistan before we hit the record button. So this is going to be about Afghanistan. And like, I drink once a week now and it's yeah. tonight and it's when we do this and it's no more than three beers. And then I don't touch alcohol again. Right. It, it, it's, you know, it's not alcoholism. It's not functioning alcoholism. I've seen alcoholics, right. I, I, I we, we know what they look like, but at the same time, I have been able to see within myself that, Oh, I was drinking a lot. I wasn't. Yeah. You know, and it was like, I'd get home and I'd have two or three beers. Cause I needed to have two or three beers when I got home every day, no matter what. Mm. So now, you know, down to one, you know, down to what, two or three beers once a week. And I, I feel a lot better for that. Right. And I bring that story up to just kind of talk about, you know, I, I, I won't say that I, I have undiagnosed issues. I don't think I do everything. You know, my issues have been diagnosed, but one of the, probably the biggest stigma that is, that surrounds the veteran community, right, is everybody's got PTSD, everybody's got a TBI, and nobody wants to get help for it, mm -hmm. right? And, and I, I, and obviously those first two are not accurate, but I, 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 I think there's a little merit to that third point that, you know, just the veteran community, it excuse me, for some reason, it, it seems like either we don't want to believe that we have, you know, you know, some things that need to be addressed, or we think that we can just, you know, bottle it, you know, push it down and, and carry on. Or, it, you know, it's it's not real, it's, it's made up. And, you know, with your with your work and your outreach, how much of that do you run into where it's, it's people who uh, and, and, you know, us included, possibly, I, I know I for the longest time said, No, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. But people who just say, you know, it, that's not the issue. I'm fine. I'm perfectly fine. And then finally realize, oh, I'm, I'm so messed up from years of, you know, exposure to bomb blast or, you know, burn pits or you know, whatever the case may be. And then they finally start to get that help and they start to yeah. improve. Yeah. And I think a lot of that, just to caveat on that, I, there is that huge stigma for a long time, like veterans were crazy and there's this selling a propaganda of what PTSD was and and what we were all like and they were making these movies about veterans going crazy and beating up everybody and flying off the handle and you know uh that is I'd say even less than the regular five percent of all of everybody that served and and that stigma made it so for me personally um, I didn't want to be labeled like as, oh, you're crazy or whatever. And, um, and the other part of it is you don't want to, you don't want to be lumped into those groups and, and be made to feel that you're quote unquote broken and unstable. And so that was another thing for me on why I didn't want to get help is because I didn't want to be labeled as the extreme side, you know, and, um, because mental health could be as simple as like, dude, I'm just really depressed today and I'm, I'm having problems with my marriage and this is, you know, and you're dealing with a lot. And instead of talking about those things because of all these stigmas of people being messed up, and you don't want to be messed up. Nobody wants to talk about it. And so that's the biggest thing, um, especially through doing the work that I'm doing now. Um, most of the people reach out and they're like, you're saying things that I wish I could say, um, or I wish I, I could articulate that the way you did. Um, and so it's not that uh, people aren't feeling the same way. It's that 
they don't know if like, is it okay if I say this? Is this being too vulnerable? Is this being too emotional or is, is that normal? And what I try and tell everybody is that's like super normal. What you went through is not normal. Going through combat, going through all your MOS schools, whether it's infantry side or intel side or doing whatever, like you're going through all these stressors and they're and you're deploying and you're and you're coming home and you're losing sleep and you're eating poorly and your body is going to have a stressful reaction. You're going to be stressed out like physically, mentally and emotionally. And that is normal. And so that's just the biggest thing is trying to explain to people like even the smallest issue, you should start finding somebody you can speak to and talk to and just get it out, even if you think it's insignificant, because all that stuff builds up and it builds up. And then the next thing you know, you snap. And I don't mean snap in a bad way. I mean, you end up like being super depressed or people kill themselves or, you know, and it's all because they didn't want to get stigmatized. What did you, I, I know I was browsing your in, uh, Instagram page. Um, so, I mean, we've talked a lot about the, the downsides of everything. Like you said, I mean, no matter what you did in, in the military, it was a pretty much a constant source of stress for most anybody that, that was in it. it. It's just not a very happy place to be. Uh, it doesn't really matter what your job is. It's just a, it's a stressful kind of, like you said, just, it's just a big stressor on your body. And most people are doing that for four at least four years. And most people are doing yeah, longer. Absolutely. And like you said, it's cumulative, right? I mean, you do that for mm -hmm. a long enough time, you kind of get sucked into it. And part of being sucked into that culture is kind of a, almost a defeatist kind of uh, depression. There's a certain depression associated with it. And, and yeah, somebody absolutely. told me once, yeah, that maybe that depression is, is not, is a appropriate reaction to the modern life. Essentially, somebody told me that like, yeah, you're depressed, but maybe that is the correct response to living in, in modernity and living in this world yeah. that we live in. And, and, and they had a good point. And, and so when I look at your Instagram page, I'm seeing a lot of outdoor, like na natural activities. And, and one thing I found, cause I went to the VA and I, I've taken, like you said, it, you just tell them what's wrong and they'll just put you on a new drug that day. Because I told them, I was like, right. man, I don't sleep and, or I'm having trouble sleeping. Like I have, you know, these bad dreams. And like, he'll be he'll like, here's a, uh, <laughs> here's a, uh, an alpha blocker. We use an off label to treat your, you know, nightmares. <laughs> yeah. I took it one time, damn near died in my kitchen. Cause my blood pressure dropped. So, you know, I just like about <laughs> fell down on the floor. Just Which is out. common. A lot of people are dying from drug interactions and, 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 oh, yeah. and drugs that have contraindication. And, you know, so a lot of people aren't even killing themselves. They're just taking too many yeah. drugs. And, and they'll give you whatever. And like a, as an RN now, like I, I understand like, oh, I know what an alpha blocker does. But like yeah. at the time, I'm just like, my God, man, like I, why do I feel like I'm going to die? That overwhelming sense of doom, you know, says my blood pressure is probably like 70, you know? Right. And, um, but, but, but I say all that to say this, like, you know, you, you have found a way out of it. It seems like we've found not, there's really no way out of it. I mean, there's not a cure, I don't think to PTSD or mental trauma necessarily. There are simply ways that you deal with mental trauma. And healthy ways to do it and for me personally like lately and, and more than anything the va has ever done as far as like uh counseling or drugs it's just i, I go fly fishing as much as i can just to be yeah. outside and by a river in like this zen activity and that's about the only thing to me that that's that's calming and peaceful anymore i don't know can you give us some of your coping mechanisms yeah so uh definitely one of my coping me mechanisms for like dealing with depression, like throughout the day, or if I'm having a... Uh... We apologize. There was some bad weather in Idaho that knocked out Jordan's power. Uh, we lost connection there for a bit. Uh, Jordan mentioned taking cold showers as one of his uh, coping mechanisms. And so we'll start right back into that after we get our power back. Yeah. So tell us about the, uh, the cold showers before Idaho screwed us over. Yeah, no worries. Um, so like when I was, I forgot where I was, like when I'd have depressed days or bad days, it's like a tool I use throughout the day. So um, if I'm just really, really struggling and I'm in my head, uh, one of the things about depression, anxiety and all this stuff is they're all emotional and, and feelings based, like they're, they're within your own nervous system. And so it's brought on by a lack of feeling in control, right? So when you're 
depressed or you're anxious, you're like, oh, I can't do this, or you get really, really sad, and you're just really in your emotions, and you're not really in your mind. And so I'll take a cold shower, and I'll as soon as like that cold water hits, my body's like, get me out of here. This is I'm not doing this. And I'll sit there and force my body to just take it until it realizes like it's not going unless I say so. And then so once those thoughts of hurry, get out, stop, this is cold, kind of go away. And I'm and I realize like I am fully in control of my my emotions and my feelings and my body again, then I'll get out. And it's like a quick reset. Um, that's free. And that's one way because I know cold therapy is getting huge. You guys see that all the time. People are dunking themselves in bathtubs filled with ice and all that. But uh, on a really practical scale, cold showers uh, can be a really helpful tool um, just to get that right back. And it helps practice uh, staying in control of your emotions and, and, and helping your nervous system realize that, no, I'm in control. The mind is able to control these things um, and, and not make just choices, decisions, and, and, and actions based off feelings and emotions. Well, I, I'm just going to say real quick, as somebody who had to take a cold shower every day in Baghdad, because I worked the night shift, uh, I am not as uh, open to the idea of taking cold showers whilst living in America. But I'll keep it in mind. Yeah. I'll keep it in mind. Yeah. And you don't have to just get in. like So you can get in and have the water warm, like, like a warm shower. And then like the last 30 seconds of it, flip it to really, really cold and just sit there and get that shock. And that's really what does it. About 20 seconds, 30 seconds. And then get out. Yeah, I've seen the cold therapy videos where people are in their bathtubs full of ice. And I thought, not only does that look miserable, I wondered what it did other than just being a trendy uh, TikTok thing. But uh, now that you've explained it, mm -hmm. it makes sense, assuming that's what they're doing. So Yeah, endor endorphins. Um, I, it, it pumps a whole chemical cocktail into you. Adrenaline, endorphins, all the good stuff. It's like... Um... Something that I've, I've been thinking about leading up to this episode and, and you know, Kyle kind of talked about his. So I, I guess I'll use this to kind of talk about, you know, where, where I'm at like mentally and and, and to, to bring a, a, a broader conversation. We actually did an episode about what it's like coming back from a deployment, um, but we didn't really talk about the mental aspect. And I, I, I remember coming back mm. from, from Baghdad in 2011 and, and, and I, I I, I make it a point that like my deployment was very uh, mundane, right? I'm an intelligence analyst. I'm working in Saddam Hussein's mm -hmm. palace. There's really not a whole lot going on. Uh, I came back and I, I remember like I get I get back to Fort Bragg, and the, one of the first things we do is we we talk to a a behavioral health specialist, right? And it, it it's it's yeah. It was the most the post deployment health assessment. It was the most check the box thing I ever did in the military. It was yeah. How do you feel? It's like, well, I've been in the states for an hour, so I feel pretty damn good. You know, like well, I I don't know what the hell you want me to tell you. <laughs> uh, but then yeah. I remember about eight months later. You know, about eight months later, I had my first panic attack, and I didn't know mm. what was going on. And all I knew is that uh, my my wife's uh, brother's kids were being loud, but they're kids. That's what kids do, right? It, it, it's not a big deal. And I, I just remember sitting there, mm -hmm. I'm watching TV, and you got like a five-year-old and a three-year-old who are playing, and I don't notice it. And then like five minutes later, I'm downstairs, heavy breathing. I can't control my heart rate. I'm freaking out. And my wife's asking me what's wrong. I'm like, mm -hmm. I don't know what's wrong. I've never had this feeling before. And- I remember it took me, it took me like a, a, a whole another year after that to finally talk to somebody. And I, and I think a part of that was I looked at myself as I'm an intelligence analyst. I never left the fob. I don't know why I, you know, these things are bothering me the way they're bothering me. It's probably just, you know, I'm probably just overthinking something or I, I'm wanting something to like overtake me in the moment. Um, mm. and, and then, you know, Finally, after having mood swings for like six months where, and, and not like, 
happy one minute, frustrated the next minute, like screaming and yelling at my wife. I finally went and started mm. talking to somebody. And that that's when they kind of introduce you to the, the information that, you know, things like PTSD are not, it, it, it's not relegated to just combat arms, right? And and it's not relevant, relegated to just the military, right? It's very common in uh, you know, sexual assault and sexual harassment survivors, uh, people who've just experienced traumatic events outside the military. And I, I remember like that was probably the low point of my marriage, right? Around the time I got out of the army and I was just so angry all the time. And I couldn't explain why I was so angry. And like I went to Afghanistan as a contractor and I'm, I'm, I'm back doing the job I love doing, although I hated the hours and life was okay. I come back from Afghanistan and I remember it was January, 2018. And I have never spoken like this to a human being ever. And I went into a fit of white hot rage aimed at my three-year-old son. And I had never felt so low as a human being when I did that. The next day I went and I talked to a counselor and like we're four years removed from that now. And I, I really don't know where I would be without that. And it, it's very, right. it, it's, it's very um, disheartening to see all these stories about veterans who just don't know how to, how to go out and get that help. And you, I, there was that string for a couple of years where veterans were going to the VA parking lot and killing themselves in the parking lot because they couldn't get help. It, 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 it's, it's the most angering I, I can be nowadays is seeing just people within our community who, for one reason or another, either they, they don't know what their, their outlets are or they don't think they need help or somebody's telling them they don't need help. You know, you've, you've got the old guard that, you know, the, the, the Vietnam folks and, and the people maybe slightly before or after them saying, oh, it's all in your head. You don't need to worry about it. And then you have people within our own generation saying it's all in your head. You don't need to worry about it. Like, how do we how do we get through to those people that it's it's OK to to seek out help and to be vulnerable for a second? Mm. Um, that's a one. That's a really good question, too. Uh, that's the point is it is all in your head. <laughs> and so like people think that's a, that's like a, like a, like a slight, you know, it's like, I'm going to tell him it's all in his head. And then you're going to be like, Oh, it's all in my head. I didn't know that. And it's like, <laughs> dude, because it's in your head, it's, it's not like any other injuries. Right. So, um, when somebody breaks their arm or their leg, nobody goes, oh, when they're wearing a cast, you should just walk on it. It's just, it's just, it's just your leg. That's what it's made for. You know, it's all, it's all your leg or your arm. And no, they're like, oh, clearly he has a sling. His arm's broken. There's something he's not capable to be and do 90% of the things he, he used to do until that's fixed. Your brain is the same way, only it runs everything in your body. Your brain is like the most important. It is more important than any limb, any digit. It is the most important part of your body. And when it gets damaged, whether it's through stress, through poor diet, through trauma, through blast injuries, through blunt force injuries, when your brain is damaged, everything goes downhill. Metabolism, hormones, um, emotions, feelings, cognitive thought. And so people that say, oh, it's all just in your head. That should be like, you're right. Exactly. It is in my head. That's why I need to get help. Because if you don't get it treated, it's only going to get worse. It's not like a leg where if it doesn't get set all the way properly, you'll still be able to limp around on it. No. Once your brain goes, you go. And and that's that's one of the things I try and encourage people is like, uh, 
it isn't something that should be taken lightly. And it's not something that should be marginalized. And just because most of the time, the people that are saying it's all in their head, they have their own set of issues too. And they are insecure about them. And so they project their insecurities on other people because they don't want to get help themselves. And so, yeah, trying to encourage people to get help um, is tricky because either, like you said, the way they're raised or however their military experience was, um, like in the sniper platoons or in like special operations side, uh, you're working with a really, really small team. And so that team comes to depend on you. And we get like basically a team syndrome where uh, nothing is ever wrong with you because you want to be there for the boys and you don't want them to be out on a mission or in a hide site worrying like, oh, dude, Jordan's having a really hard time with his marriage. I wonder if he's here right now or if he's in. And so you just say, oh, everything's fine. And so but that comes into all sorts of different fields also. Like I'm sure like as an Intel guy, they don't want you to feel like that Intel is emotionally compromised or that you're unable to like present the information and, and, and get the information like without it being compromised or distorted. Um, and so everybody needs to get it into their head that it is in your head. And that's why it's important to get help whether it's you used to be filled with energy and now you're tired all the time. That's a red flag. You used to be able to communicate. And now you're slurring your words. Like I do, like I, uh, depending on the day, my slur is worse than normal, but I'm always going to have like this little slur like this. And I don't know if it's because of the cognitive damage, but in a speech, a basic speech impediment where I, will try and be saying something and then my brain will completely just go out the other. And it's not normal from where I used to be. I used to be the scout sniper I used to be able to do windage elevation and, and mill theory all in my head and write it down. And I used to articulate myself and now I have a hard time speaking sometimes. Um, and that's because of my brain. And so I need to do stuff for my brain, like diet, exercise, uh, getting the right amount of minerals and vitamins. And um, it's unfortunate that people don't realize that. They think it's a slight, like it's something you can control. Technically, because you're cognitive, you can control it. But when your brain is damaged, like you're not doing what you think you are by stuffing things away or saying I'm fine or I, you can't will yourself to get it better. You have to take steps to actually fix it. You can't will yourself to heal your arm. You have to put it in a cast and fix it. If that makes sense. You, you keep mentioning diet a lot when you talk. Um, and I just had a vodka Red Bull. So probably don't listen to me about filling your body with garbage. So <laughs> I will turn it to <laughs> I will turn it to resident expert Jordan here. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how diet affects it and and what what changes you made? Obviously, I, I assume being a scout sniper, you probably what lived off uh, MREs and Monster Energy drinks or whatever. And uh, dude, that was it I, in Copenhagen. Yeah, in Copenhagen. So I mean, Intel is very similar, but we have access to cigarettes we smuggle in from someplace and and booze Absolutely. In, the, in the aviation community, like I was in, but. You, but uh, yeah, I mean, can you tell us about the diet and how you how you fixed it and uh, and what you, what kind of changes you made? I'm interested. Yeah, so it starts out with getting my your minerals on track, and here's the deal: is like people are so malnourished, or their 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 body system is so jacked up, it's not something that's going to happen right away, right? So when I started getting my minerals on track, which means I was taking a lot, a lot of magnesium and basically making my my own magnesium bicarbonate, um, which is like just taking a jet stream, making it carbonated, and then putting um, magnesium hydroxide in there and then make some I mean, magnesium bicarbonate. Um, and then vitamin E, vitamin K, um, and then the other one has been um, 
increasing my fat intake because your brain is fat, right? So cod liver oil, retinol from whole raw milk or just whole milk in general, if you can get it. We have raw milk up here. So I'm pretty stoked about that. Eating fresh eggs. Um, and then when it comes to like the diet, I'm not really strict. I like, I'll have a bowl of ice cream at night or I'll eat a cookie or have a piece of cake or yesterday I had brownies. Um, that's not really the issue. The issue really goes into minerals and like getting correct mineral balances. So for instance, one of the very first uh, minerals your body uses up, whether you're stressed out, um, going through any type of a challenging thing, um, you get yelled at at work in that initial stress response of like feeling the body, the first thing it uses is magnesium. And so once the magnesium is started, is, is used up and that's because of this, most Americans are in a magnesium deficiency. Um, it starts to use calcium. It's supposed to be using magnesium, but instead it starts using calcium. And that's why calcium goes to all your joints and goes to your brain and you start getting calcified pineal glands and you start having osteoarthritis and because your, your body is pumping all this calcium to places where it was supposed to be pumping magnesium. Um, and so magnesium, vitamin E, vitamin K, and uh, doing like a beef liver supplement in pills. And then what's the other one? I forget the other one. But outside of those, I try and eat potatoes every day, some type of a chicken or a, a meat, like a whole meat, whether it's red or chicken or fish. And I that's basically my diet. I eat chicken and potatoes, meat and potatoes, fish and potatoes, because potatoes are a huge source of copper. And car copper is what is conductive, right? So in your mitochondria, copper is what's helping them create energy within the cells. And so over a time, when your body starts being able to be more conductive and, and move energy along the way it's supposed to without having an iron overload, but having more copper, dude, your energy starts to go up in general. And so it's not like you have to have this super strict diet where you can't drink monsters or you can't do those um, kind of things. Obviously limit them as much as you can, but it really has to do to like basic fundamentals of vitamins and minerals we used to get in our food, but we don't anymore because we're always eating MREs or fast food or junk food in general. And so you have to supplement those through vitamins and all that. Well, I'm happy to know that just by proxy of living in idaho i'm getting my copper intake by eating a potato a day yeah, absolutely dude dude you got all the potatoes <laughs> that's great and they're so much cheaper um i oh i lost my train of thought i'll come back to it so you 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 basically went from try, you know the struggles and the the buildup of of your issues finally hitting ahead to seeking help yourself and then how did you how did you go from your own recovery to helping other people with with their recoveries afterwards um so one of the ways it started is i realized that through writing i was also able to deal with my own issues and process things and get things out and so after a long time of not having any social media in 2018 I or 2017, I started Instagram and then I just started sharing my journey. I was like, I'm depressed today or I was depressed yesterday, but now I'm doing good. And it was just like basically this online journal. And then I was writing um, the things that I was learning as I was going through this process. So that way, other dudes out there that may not want to reach out for help could read the stories and then use those as guidance for, so maybe they might not want to call somebody to ask for help, but they can read, oh, I need to start sleeping or doing these and start implement those things themselves. Um, and it just started to grow from there. 
And I initially was going to college. I got three quarters of my degree is in biblical theological studies with a minor in Christian counseling for um, doing psychology. And because of my brain injury, my last semester, I just never finished um, because I went from getting like good grades to just apps. I wasn't able to accomplish anything. My brain was just going downhill. Um, so I started using a lot of prin principles that I learned from uh, getting that degree um, from psychology and philosophy and implementing those into how I was writing to help people get that this is a practical thing. Being a human being, having these problems, wanting to go through life is a journey and the way we make it better is by helping each other and being there for each other, that community, that brotherhood, sisterhood, whatever. Everybody has to do their own work internally, right? I'm the one that fixed myself. I, I couldn't have my wife fix me. I couldn't have a psychologist fix me. No one's going to fix me except me. It's up to me to, you know, take those steps to start eating healthy, to start trying these things, to start fixing myself. Right? And it takes work, but that community is there when you start to falter to encourage you and, and to help lift you up. Um, that's the other thing that's been a huge uh, wake up call for me is a lot of people want to try and fix other people. Um, and it causes frustrations and burnout and it causes the people trying to fix people frustrated and burnout. And then the people that want the help, they get disenfranchised and they're like screw that guy who was a jerk or whatever and we need to switch the methodology from you're helping people to you're fostering a space for people to help themselves you're encouraging them to help themselves and then when people start doing the work themselves that's when they start getting uh better yeah i think that's a that's a message a lot of uh a lot of former military people can can get behind and connect to as well because it's like like mm -hmm. it, it's not it's not just the the stigmas that you know kind of stop people from seeking help it's the fact that like you were you were a, a soldier or a marine or a you know, seaman or airman yeah. you, you were one of the you know what like five percent of people that'll you know join the military at any at any time right. and you kind of like uh, I, I think I think a, a lot of us, you know, don't like don't like set ourselves ab above people by those thoughts, but we kind of set ourselves like s up, apart slightly by that. Like it becomes part of mm. part of who you are, part of your identity in a way. And being right. that person, when you start having issues, you think, well, this isn't what you know a soldier or you know a marine would would uh, would struggle with, and it kind of the Absolutely. the the person the person that you you built up at when you were when you were in and you know the person that you actually are might not be the <laughs> the same person and so you you run into right you run into issues like being able to kind of like be humble enough to identify your problems and want to address them because you don't want to think that they're that they could exist and so that kind of that mm. pushes you away and sort of isolates you in your own, you know, mental struggles, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And I think as a society, too, men were told to just suck it up most of the time from the beginning. And it's it's not something you can just suck up. You know, it's something you have to actually work on, just like you lift weights or when you're doing math or you're doing schooling, you're doing anything. Your brain, when you start having those issues, you can't just suck it up. You have to you have to take that courage. And like you said, um, face those things and face them. Even if you're in, in the military, face them as you would if you were in the military, how you would face a challenge. It's just another challenge. It's not something that has to ruin your life. And um, unfortunately, it does a little too late. But if we can get people to start taking those actions and getting the help further first, I know if I would have got the help that I've been getting, I would have never 
been in the situation where I was, where I was divorced and homeless and just, it's like when I think back on that, it was a whole different person. I did all those actions. I did all those things and I was living that way, but I can't, I can't comprehend ever doing that. And that's one of those parts of a brain injury that's hard to accept is like, you are impulsive, you are really erratic, you are emotionally unstable. And that doesn't mean that's who I am as a human being, but in that state until I got fixed, that's what I was. And so people need to also see that, you know, to get better, they're gonna have to take those steps and, and, and humble themselves into saying like, all right, I do need help because I know who I am and what I want to be, and this is not it. So like, with, with that in mind, um, you know, we, we've talked a lot about our, our personal issues. Obviously, we talked to your issues. Uh, when, when did you, in, in your, as, as I put it on Instagram, like your personal road to recovery, if you will, when did you get the, the, the inclination that I want to do this and help other people out? I, what was the what was the process to come to that that decision point? It was 2018 or 17. Wait, no, 2018. Um, I had to spend six months in a hotel room uh, for I was on house arrest, and so because I lived in Idaho and I got my DUI in California, uh, I had to do house arrest in California. Since I didn't have a place to live, I had to <laughs> live in a hotel room, um, and that maxed out my budget. So I was I would like get all the eggs, the hard boiled eggs from breakfast and, and sandwiches, and that's pretty much what I would like live off of, um, unless I ordered a DoorDash. But it was during that time of complete isolation. Um, I was all alone, except for people I would communicate with through my phone. Um, and just sit in this hotel room or maybe sometimes go sit by the pool, but I was alone for six months. And during that process of learning and, and, and reading and writing, um, it was a really bad year for a lot of people throughout the military, whether we lost a lot of snipers, Marine Corps snipers, we lost a lot of Army cats, a lot of people just started dropping from suicide. And I wanted to help people realize that that's not the route you have to take and that there is there is a path forward um, outside of having to go the suicide route. Because I went that route. Um, I'm, I'm lucky enough that uh, I failed miserably. And, um, and so being intimate with being that low and being intimate with being depressed and being tired and, and having marital issues and doing all those things. Um, I was a staff NCO when I got out, I was a, a, a E6 staff sergeant. And so leading men and leading and guiding people is in my blood. And so, I just set it upon my heart to lead and guide people to like getting better onto healing and to living a fuller life, no matter what they're going through, what trauma, what disaster, what experience, there is a way to heal and move forward. That doesn't have to define the rest of your life. Yeah, I think that's uh that's pretty impactful, Jordan. And uh, I think we'll, we're all, we're all glad you're, you're here with us and, um, and that you're doing some work to try to um, curtail some of this. And uh, it seems like it does get pretty bad at times uh, with, with military suicides mm -hmm. and, and depression and all that. So um, we've, we're about at the hour mark. So uh, we always give our guests the last word. And um, it, we'd like to, um, if you have anything you want to say, any place people can look you up, find you, any resources you want to um want to throw out there anything you want to say we'd like to give you the floor here at the end all right um so closing shots all right so basically um from here on out 
they can get a hold of me on my Instagram, which is warhippy underscore. Um, and I also have a Facebook, but I'm creating a website and program, online program now called the DAR site. And um, my focus more so is moving towards uh, emotional, mental, and spiritual health. And so uh, that's what I'm going to be covering a lot of topics because that's where my heart is, is on the philosophy side and how to live a good life and how to be a father, how to be a husband, how to be a man. Um, and uh, my dad killed himself about two months after my 16th birthday. And so my heart is for the youth in like up to like the mid, late 20s, 30s, um, on top of veterans and first responders. And um I got a lot of good stuff coming and I'm super stoked about it. And the final thing I'd just say about that is I know it's, it's hard to maintain communication. We all have friends and we all send each other a text every now and then. Um, and that's okay, but find a group of friends that you can be vulnerable with, right? Like I have a very good friend. Um, who we got on the phone together and he's able to just pour his soul out to me on what he's struggling and cry and about his marriage. And, and, and he knows that it's safe. Like I'm not going to tell anybody who it is, what's going on and, and having that space to be able to just be open and vent having those types of brothers and finding those people. Um, that is a huge blessing. And, and, and tool to use. So a lot of people feel alone, right? That's a common thing is that I just feel so alone. Um, I know for me personally, we're alone by choice for the most part. Like, and it's just coming to that place to humble yourself when somebody says, Hey, how you doing? Instead of, Oh, I'm doing good. You'd be like, actually, do you have this? T if I, one thing that I've implemented is when somebody asks me how I'm doing, if it's a, it's a really close friend, I don't just do this to everybody, but I'll be like, hey, are you capable of, or not even capable, are you in the space to let me vent? You know, because I don't want them to ask and then just all of a sudden I'm just dumping everything in the mother on them. And they're like, well, dude, I got five minutes. I'm just driving to work. I was trying to say hi. <laughs> um, nope, looks like power's back on. But uh so that's one of those things is like call somebody or when you're talking to them, find that close brotherhood, be like, Hey, I really need to talk about some things. Is this a good time? And then if it's not, they can be like, Hey, call back in an hour or call back this or text me this time, or we'll set up a time tomorrow. That way you don't feel alone anymore. You know, you have a solution coming up. You know, you have that community coming up and, uh, that's like the best step to move forward, man. It's just get back into that brotherhood and sisterhood that we all love. As a as a society, we've become, quote unquote, so social that we've lost our ability to be social. And we've lost that intimacy of communication and relationship because everything's done through the phone. Um, and it's really, really healing to talk to other men. Iron sharpens iron. And that's not like, a cliche term it is the truth and so that's it man we're all in it together thanks so much jordan that was that's that's awesome man and uh glad you're glad you're working on it and helping others that's uh it's a big thing all right all right guys it's the end of season two thank you so much for joining us here for us uh, moving on to YouTube um, to add to our uh, bevy of different uh, podcast locations we have to, you know, all of the different topics that we've been able to cover on here uh, to doing that, uh, that AMA that, uh, that brought a lot of you to us. We're so grateful to, um, to have the audience that we have and uh, stay tuned. We'll be back um, in July with uh, a bevy of new topics for you and we we're we're really excited we can't wait to see you so take care 